Hello, hello. Welcome to Courage Becomes Her, where we connect and share real life stories. I'll talk with women whom I love and I'm inspired by women who are experiencing life just like you and me. I'm excited for us to gather together and cultivate confidence, courage, and joy in life and work. Well, hello, friends. Thank you so much for joining me today for this bonus episode of Courage Becomes Her, where we're continuing our summer read series. Today, I am talking with Dr. Michelle Bankson, who is an international speaker a national and international media resource on mental health, which obviously we all know is a huge topic for every one of us. It's hitting all of our lives in some way or another. She also is the best-selling and award-winning author of Hope Prevails, which she talks just a tad bit about in our conversation today, as well as her other books, The Hope Prevails Bible Study, Today is Going to Be a Good Day, and Breaking Anxiety's Grip. All of those are listed in the show notes for you if you want to take a look at them. Dr. Michelle is also the host of the award-winning podcast, Your Hope-Filled Perspective. She is a board-certified clinical neuropsychologist and has been in private practice for more than 20 years. She regularly blogs and offers a wide variety of resources, including things on mental health on her website, which is also linked for you in the show notes. So today we are talking about her newest book, The Hem of His Garment, Reaching Out to God When Pain Overwhelms. So in our conversation today, she talks about the realization that she needed to share her story about physical pain that left her bedridden and depressed. And she also talks about different types of pain, including the pain that is caused by well-intentioned, well-meaning people in our lives. She also talks about the ideas and the thoughts that can be harmful to us in our healing process and the importance of building new neural or mental pathways that are constructed from healthy thoughts. So such a great conversation. Thank you so much for listening in. I know you are going to be encouraged as well as just learn some really valuable insights and ideas from Dr. Michelle Bankson today. Dr. Michelle, thank you so much for joining me for this bonus episode conversation for Courage Becomes Her. I'm really glad to have you with me and to be able to talk about your book here in a moment. I've been looking forward to this conversation. I enjoy your podcast. So it's fun to be a guest instead of just a listener. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. So let's get to know you a little bit first, and then we'll talk about your new book. So first off, where is home? Home now and before is the Dallas, Texas area. We moved away for a little while, but we have moved back. Although if I'm being honest, I think I have left a little bit of my heart in each of the places that I've lived. So Mm -hmm. home is also Michigan. Home is also Birmingham, Alabama. It's also in Florida, but our primary home and where I absolutely love to call home is in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Okay. Yeah. And I can understand that of leaving your a little bit of yourself in each place. I can relate to that yeah. for sure. And a little bit about home life. Tell us a little bit about that. I'm a wife for 35 years to my husband, Scott, who is a three-time cancer survivor. And I'm mom to two grown boys. So we are learning to navigate the empty nest and learning how to parent adult children, Mm -hmm. which is so much different than parenting toddlers, I might say. (laughs) But that's my favorite role is to be wife and mom. Our oldest son is getting married this summer. And so life is changing for all of us, but we're looking forward to having a new daughter in love. Oh, that's so beautiful. Wonderful for you too, for sure. Good, good change in season, I imagine. Yeah. All right. What's a current obsession of yours in any genre? This might seem silly, but I tend to be a coffee drinker, but not so much for the coffee as 
all the add-ins, the creamer <laughs> that you put in the coffee. So I've been trying to become more of a tea drinker. And in Texas, we have a franchise called HTO, H-T-E-A-O. And that has become my obsession because they have about 30 flavors of sweet tea and about 40 flavors of unsweet tea. And so you'll often find me going through the drive-thru at HTO trying a new tea concoction. Okay. Wow. Gosh, in all my trips to Texas, I have not stumbled across that yet. So I'm going to have to check that one out. Because I'm, I'm a it's big tea person too. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. What has filled your cup in the last few days or so? In the last couple of days, we had the opportunity to go to Fort Knox in Kentucky and see our future daughter in love for family day and for her army cadet graduation. Wow. And just seeing a young life following after God's call on her life and doing what she was meant to do and doing it to serve our country. That was a huge cup overflow mm. experience. Mm. That sounds wonderful. And what a lovely woman she must be for sure. Mm, so good. Okay, last one. What is a book that has transformed your life? Bob Sorge's The Secret of the Secret Place. Mm. It's a book that really transformed my quiet time huh. and helped underscore the importance of my quiet time and how I can look to it it's more of God in and through that time. That book so transformed my life. I've read it probably a dozen times. I've gifted it to at least a dozen people because wow. it was that transformative for me. Secrets of the Secret Place. I love it. I have never I've read that. I've heard of him, but that's I'm going to have to add that one to my list. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so you have a new book out, and this is book number five of yours. It is. Okay, it is. Book well, congratulations. Five. That's so wonderful. So, The Hem of His Garment Reaching Out to God When Pain Overwhelms. So, I'm so excited to talk about a variety of things in this, but one of the, I guess, the starting place that I'd like for us to start is. In your previous books, you share quite a bit about your personal journey, and it's clear through uh, what you share in the hem of his garment that you are no stranger to pain and suffering. And one of the stories that you tell actually toward the very end of it is how you showed your bruised black and blue bruised arm to a patient of yours who was despairing about her own black and blue bruised arm from each of you having different medical treatments. And in that you talk about it kind of being a pivotal moment for you of realizing that you needed to share your story of pain and suffering. So I'd love to just kind of start there of that realization and, and how that came to you of like, okay, I need to actually share these hard things in life. I went through a life-threatening illness. I had actually been at my private practice and seeing patients. And I was working with a patient when I doubled over in pain. And I knew something was wrong, like really wrong. So I got my patient up to the front office staff where they could take care of the patient's needs. And as I was going back to my office, my husband happened to come through the back door in the middle of the day, which was not wow. typical. And he said, honey, you don't look very good. And I said, I I'm not. I, I think you need to take me home. And things progressed and got worse on the way home to the point that we ended up going to the hospital. And long story short, I was very ill. Mm -hmm. I was ended up on medically induced bed rest for five months. I was kept alive on IV hydration and nutrition. Mm -hmm. I dwindled from uh, 113 pounds down to a skeletal 74 Wow. which is 30 minutes lighter than I am today. Mm -hmm. And the longer I remained in that state, I ended up having two emergency surgeries. And so it was a, was a long journey a long, painful process. Mm -hmm. And because it was so severe, I couldn't go to work and see patients mm -hmm. in my private practice. And I remember 
crying out to God and saying, you know, if I, if I can't be that doctor, if I can't go and help patients, like what good am I, what good mm-hmm. is my life? And the longer I remained ill and on bed rest and not seemingly getting any better, the more depression overtook. So not only did I have a medical condition, but then I was also wrestling with the dark night of the soul to the point that I did cry out to God and said, you know, if this is going to be my life, God, I'm I'm not sure I want to go on living. And that was coming from a mental health professional who yeah. treats people for depression all the time. And the, as they came in and gave me the IVs to keep me alive, I literally was bruised from my neck down to my wrist. And every time they would try to find a viable vein, the longer I was sick, the harder it was for them to find a vein. And then sometimes it would take three, four, five sticks for them to get one. And so the bruising was bad. And I remember when I finally turned a corner and my physician said, you can go back to work, but only on a very very part-time basis, Mm. like start off with one or two patients and see how that goes for a week. And then maybe increase it to three patients, but very part-time. And do you know that in those five months, as horrendous as it was, the beauty of those five months was that I could do nothing other than sleep, pray, listen to praise and worship music and watch sermons online. Mm. And during that time, it was like I was cocooning with God. Mm. Now, it didn't start off feeling that way. But by the end of the five months, when I was okay to go back on a part time basis, I cried the first morning because I just wanted to stay in my cocoon with God. Like we had become so close. He had become my everything. Mm. I didn't want to go back and be the doctor anymore. Mm. But I knew that I was supposed to. And the very first patient I saw, she came in, she was suicidal. She'd had a long-term chronic medical condition. She came in with a sleepless blouse on and she was just battered and bruised just like I was. And she said, "I, I, I just don't know that I want to go on anymore. I don't have hope anymore. And I've never heard the audible voice of God, but it was like, I don't know how to describe it other than like a holy whisper where God's show her. Wow. And I argued with God. I was like, no, I mean, in mental health, there's only so much that we share, you know, it's about the patient Mm -hmm. and to go to the private practice. I was still on an IV, but I had to cap off the IV and I rolled down my sleeves. So it covered up everything, but I heard God very clearly. It was like, he was whispering, show her. Mm. She was so desperate. And I said, I'm not exactly sure why you are here, except for me to encourage you today. And I feel like I need to share with you that you're not all alone. And I rolled up my sleeve and I showed her my battered and bruised arms and she just cried. And she expressed that in that moment, she knew that God had her there for a reason. And that if I could get through it, that she could get through it too. And that was probably one of the most pivotal learning experiences for me. Yeah in that God doesn't waste our pain. Yeah. We may not see it when we are going through it and hindsight's off in 2020, but it was as I could look back on the pain that I thought, okay, thank you, Lord, that there is a purpose in our pain and suffering, even when we don't want to go through pain and suffering. And the depression that I went through, that ended up becoming a book, Hope Prevails, Insights from a Doctor's Personal Journey through depression. So it was my story of what I learned so that I could comfort others with the same comfort God gave me. It was such a valuable learning experience for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So good and so helpful and necessary for us in our journeys. I love that so much. What it kind of digging into the pain side a little bit, one of the things that you do in the book is you name the kind of types of pain and define them. And one that you specifically call out is one that I often hear from my clients, coaching clients, but 
that really gets minimized and that I personally think we don't take seriously enough. You talk about secondary pain. So talk to us about secondary pain and and why you call attention to that through this book. It's so important that we recognize that there is such a thing as secondary pain. Secondary pain is a pain that is often caused by the words or the actions or even the lack of words or actions of other people that heap shame and guilt Mm -hmm. on a person who's already experiencing physical or emotional or relationship pain or spiritual pain. And so secondary pain kind of comes in and frequently accuses us as to we think this caused your pain or you caused it because you did something or you didn't do something. Or it can also show up in terms of people often Mm well-intentioned. I need to mention that part. Yeah. People are often very well intentioned in their suggestions, but they'll say things like, oh, have you tried X, Y, and Z? As if the person suffering hasn't already tried everything under the sun Mm -hmm. and they wish that sure, another idea would work. But really it's a little bit like Job's friends. Mm -hmm. Job's friends sat with him for a week in silence that ministered to Job. It let him know he wasn't alone in his suffering. But when his friends started saying, well, you caused it because of X, Y, and Z, or you just need to do A, B, and C, that heaped secondary pain on the pain that Job was already experiencing. And people are so often very well-intentioned, but their words or their actions can actually create more pain for the pain sufferer. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, Gosh. So I want to dig into that a little bit more because there are a few that you kind of, that are beliefs, ideas, or things that are said that you call out that really are not helpful and often are hurtful, especially during seasons of pain and suffering. Uh, The first one that I just love that you call this one out is that God doesn't give you more than you can handle. So talk a little bit about our, our thought process, our belief around that. When I was going through depression, when my husband was going through cancer, when we were evacuating our son from a hurricane, after I received a cancer diagnosis, that was the comment that I probably heard the most often. Mm. Just remember, God doesn't give us more than we can handle. And seriously, I have searched the scriptures and I invite anyone to show me how that is biblical. Because what I see in the scriptures is that frequently God does allow circumstances and pain into our life that without him, we couldn't handle it. That's right. Yep. So I think pain is often an opportunity for us to learn how to depend on God. But that statement, God doesn't give us any more than we can handle, really assumes that within ourselves, we're able to handle anything that comes our way. Mm -hmm. And that's not how I read situations like the woman with the issue of blood in scripture, or Job and what he experienced, or even Jesus. Jesus in the garden is sweating blood and crying out Mm -hmm. to his father. Mm -hmm. And so I think we do a real disservice with that cliche, because We can look at Paul's example when he was struck with the thorn in the flesh. And it says a a messenger came so that he would not become proud. And he prayed three times, God, please remove this thorn. Hmm. And God in his circumstance said, I'm not going to remove the thorn, but I promise you that my grace is sufficient for you. And in that he was saying, you and I together will get through this alone. But you can't do it on your own, Paul, and neither can we. Yeah. Mm, So good. Thank you. So another one that you call out and you kind of just alluded to it and talking about the story of Job is this idea that 
we did something wrong, that this is a punishment, uh, you know, uh, uh, to us for something that we've done. So talk a little bit about that one. People often like to say things like, well, you must have unconfessed sin in your life Mm -hmm. or you're not praying enough. Or if only you had eaten this certain diet, or if only you took this certain supplement. And there is that underlying message that if you experience pain in this life, you must have done something to cause it. And by extension, that would also mean then there's something you can do to undo it. That's right. Yeah. But that's not what I see consistent in scripture. Jesus tells us in this life, you will experience trouble. He doesn't say in this life, you will cause trouble for yourself. Mm -hmm. In fact, he tells us in John 10, 10, that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And what I love about that story of Job, Job and I spent a couple of years together Mm -hmm. processing all the different types of pain I've endured. And what I realized is the very first sentence in Job 1 reads that Job was blameless and upright. Yeah. I don't even measure up there. I am not blameless. I am not upright. I sin. But that story, it starts off telling us just what a good man Job was. Mm. And the enemy is roaring around the the earth, seeking someone he can devour. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? (laughs) It wasn't because Job had done something. And that is such a lesson for us not to approach people with a a heart of seeking what caused it. Mm -hmm. God knows what caused it. And God also knows what will heal it. We can do so much better if we would come alongside with a heart of compassion and engage and be present in someone's suffering rather than blaming and condemning when honestly, we don't really know the cause of a lot of people's affliction. Mm -hmm. Mm. That's so good and so true. Love that so much. Hello, friends, just popping into this conversation with Michelle super quickly to remind you that Baker Books is giving away two copies of Michelle's new book, The Hem of His Garment, to The Courage Becomes Her Listeners. All that you need to do to enter the giveaway to win a copy is go to my Instagram, Laurel Emery on Instagram, the August 4th post, and the details to enter to win are right there. They're very easy, very straightforward, and very simplistic. So head on over there to uh, enter to win your copy of Michelle's new book. I also would love it if you will share this episode with a woman in your life who is experiencing pain and suffering in her life any sort of pain, but obviously, especially physical pain, as Michelle and I talk about that uh, in her life and how she's experienced that. So please think of the woman in your life that you can share today's episode with. One of the things that you bring up from your position as a brain scientist, as someone who really understands the workings of our brains, is about this concept of mental pathways. And I'd love for you to just kind of expand on what that is. Tell us a little bit about that and and why that's important for us when we're in a place of pain and suffering. The mind is such a beautiful, amazing organ that God has given us, but he has also told us in his holy scriptures of how important it is to pay attention to our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And he says in scripture that our thoughts and our words can breed life or death, blessing or cursing. But what happens is when we start to develop beliefs, whether they are true or not, whether they are lies or they are truth, the more we come into agreement with them, the more we speak them and say them and think them, Mm -hmm. the more they become entrenched in our mental pathways. And that's where we will default the next time something happens. So a silly example, but, but meaningful is, is when as a child, we're taking a test and maybe we're the last one to turn in the test. And we have the thought, I'm just so stupid. Mm 
Hmm. Well, then the next time something happens, maybe we get a B on a homework assignment instead of an A, then we're more likely to think, see, I'm just so stupid. Hmm. And we will look for confirmatory evidence of those thoughts that we believe, and we can always find them. But the problem is, is that we need to recognize where our thoughts come from. God has given us the Holy Spirit to remind us of his truth, but we also have this very real enemy and he knows the most effective place to defeat us is in our thoughts. Mm -hmm. That's exactly why he spoke to Eve in the garden and said, did God really say Mm -hmm. like he was getting her to question what she thought about God and what she thought to be true. And he Mm -hmm. does the same thing to us today Mm -hmm. for we've been talking about pain. And so the enemy will often whisper and will have the thought, if God really loved me, would he have let this happen to me? If God is really capable of healing, how come he hasn't healed me yet? Mm -hmm. If he loves me, why didn't he heal me? And so it's so important that we pay attention to the thoughts that we have, because those thoughts, basically, it's a little bit like a street. If you're going down a country dirt road, the more often you drive in the same track, the deeper the track gets so that it's harder to drive outside of that track. Well, your brain is the same way. And the thoughts you have will create these pathways, these tracks that you will follow. And so it is work to overcome our faulty thinking and to create these new pathways that are based on truth. Mm -hmm. But that's the process that God talks about, about renewing our mind and transforming our thoughts to be consistent with what he says. Think about that child who was the last person to turn in the test. What if they had been taught when they think, I'm just so stupid? What if they're taught, no, that's not what God says about you. God says you have the mind of Christ. Mm. Then they can form that new pathway. No, I have the mind of Christ and Christ was pretty smart. So I, I, I'm i okay. I'm doing good. Mm. The difference that two different ways of thinking can impact the rest of our life. Oh, it's so, so good. So you talk about a, quite a few examples throughout the book of ways that we can create new neural pathways, mental pathways that are positive and that are helpful in seasons of uh, pain and suffering. A couple that stood out to me that I'd like for us to talk about, and you just kind of alluded to one of them, is encourage yourself in the Lord is one of the ones that you talk about. And I think that's maybe something that we maybe kind of know intuitively or is common sense, but we because it's so common sense, we kind of lose sight of it. So talk a little bit about that one. Yeah, scripture talks about how David had to encourage himself in the Lord. You know, the Psalms are full of spiritual whiplash. It's like you'll read on the one hand, why so downcast? Oh, my soul. And yet I will trust him. Mm-hmm. And that is him taking the time to acknowledge what's real acknowledge that he's experiencing pain, but then choosing where he's going to put his trust. I think a lot of times we do intuitively know that we should do this, but when we're in pain, pain steals the best of us, Mm. whether it's physical or emotional or relationship pain, it steals the best of us. It steals the best of our attention, the best of our energy, the best of our intentions. And so we can get lazy Hmm. in terms of how we cope and we can allow despair to come in. And I experienced that in that Mm -hmm. example I gave you from Mm -hmm. so many decades ago of when I was so sick and then depression took over, that despair took over. But what I didn't share about that example was during that time when I was so physically ill and on bed rest and depressed, I began to go down that pathway of, I must just be joy immune. Mm. Now, I've never heard that term, but I looked around at other people and I was doing all the things I would normally suggest to my patients to do. And I looked at people and thought, how do they have joy? And I don't, I must be joy immune. Mm. Well, by spending time in the word of God, he reminded me of the verse that says, the weeping may last for the night, 
My joy comes in the morning. And the verse where Jesus talks about he came so that we might have joy and have it to the full. Hmm. And I thought, well, if weeping may last for the night, but his joy comes in the morning and Jesus came to give us joy, I can't be joy immune. So I started dealing with those negative mindsets by encouraging myself in the Lord by simply when I would read a passage or hear somebody say a Bible verse or a sermon, if something really pierced my heart, like, oh, I needed that. I wrote it down on a post-it note and I put it where I would see it. And then every time I saw it, I read it out loud three times. And the reason I did that is because scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hmm. Well, by the time it was all said and done, Laurel, I had over a hundred of those. They were everywhere. They were on my mirror, on my light switch. They were on the dashboard of my car, but I was encouraging myself in the word. Hmm. Nobody else was going to do it for me. And I think so often the enemy attacks us in our mind because he knows that he's not going to be convinced until we are. And we have to convince ourselves that God's truth is true for us as well. Yeah. Mm. So, so good. Thank you. You talked about it and brought it up a moment ago of Jesus being in the place where he sweat blood. And I think that that is one of the ones that you talk about through the book of it being a way for us, you know, to that new neural pathways, new mental pathways of reminding ourselves of his suffering and what he experienced. But I think we tend to minimize that because he's God, right? But it, I, I think from what you talk about in the book, like there, we need to give more credit to that. We need to pay more attention to that. So talk a little bit about that. It's very easy to think of Jesus and all the miracles he performed and all the good deeds that he did and all the teaching that he offered. And just like you said, think about him as God walking around among us because he is God. But scripture also tells us that he was also fully man Mm -hmm. and that he went through the same tempting that we will go through but he showed us how we could deal with it scripture says that we don't have a high priest who's not acquainted with our suffering but because jesus came as fully man he experienced pain and grief and loss and heartache and when we can think of him like that, we when we can think of him in that garden crying out to God, saying, please, if there is any other way, take this suffering away, mm. then we can recognize he can relate to us in our pain and suffering. He asked God, is there any other way? But then the important piece is, but then he said, but not my will, yeah. but yours. So he was fully human. He asked God, look, please, please don't make me go through this. Mm. But if it is your will, then I will surrender to your will. But that makes him so much more human Mm. and relatable. Like he does understand when I'm crying out and I think I can't make it one more moment. I cannot imagine being in such agony that I sweat blood. Mm -hmm. That is severe. But I can imagine the many nights that I spent crying, thinking, God, I I don't know if I can do it five more minutes. Please take this pain away. Mm. That's what Jesus said. Yeah. Mm. So, so, so good. Thank you. When you were talking about like people's best intentions, but saying things that, you know, maybe are not helpful, you kind of talked about the idea of, not doing enough. And I think that that is one of the things that you kind of, you talk about like, don't, don't do of not fighting, uh, not, you know, just trying to make your own way forward and, you know, cure things or fix things uh, yourself. But you talk about waiting on God's victory on our behalf, I think is a specific uh, sentence that you use. So 
talk about that because I think, I mean, we do, we want to fix it ourselves. So how do we get to that place where we stop fighting and stop trying to fix it ourselves and wait on God's victory on our behalf? There is a place for doing, for sure. And God gives us lots of instruction in his word. And so there is a place for us to do what we can, but we can actually exacerbate our pain when we adopt that false belief that it's all up to me. Mm -hmm. And that's what culture says. If it's going to be, it's up to me, whether you have a type A personality or not. And the thing about pain is that what we really want is for that pain to be healed yesterday. Mm -hmm. And so we can develop a tendency to keep trying to do the next thing in hopes that that's going to be the magic cure. Now, I think that we do need to do some things. We do need to engage in some Mm self-care. We do need to prioritize rest to make sure that we're eating right and being in the word. But Jesus was a great role model for us. There are plenty of times in scripture where things got to be too much Mm -hmm. and he went away. He got away from people and the outside noise and Mm -hmm. got quiet and spent time with his father. And one of the things that God wants to do for us sometimes, his way is not to necessarily heal the one thing that we most want healed, Mm -hmm. whether it's physical healing or a relationship to be mended, but frequently behind the scenes, he's bringing greater healing in an area that we didn't even know Mm -hmm. we needed. And so if we can get to the place where like Jesus, we say, God, I, I want you to take this pain away, but I'm going to trust you and what you have for me in this, it can take the burden off our shoulders. Yeah. Jesus says, if any of you are weary, come to me and I will give you rest. And when we're in the midst of pain, we tend to do, do, do. But sometimes what we need to do is step back, rest, get quiet, because when it's loud and when we're doing, we can't hear God's voice as readily and the things that he has for us in this season. Mm. So good. I love that so much. And it is uh, definitely counter to our nature, but just so, uh, so important and makes all the difference. So, mm, wow. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful for you and your courage to continue to share your story through your, your books and your writing and to encourage us and help us in our journeys. I'd love to know who or what is inspiring courage in you right now in this season. Most recently, it has been the readers who are helping me on my launch team for the Hem of His Garment. I opened up a chat in that group and said, what what area of pain are you dealing with? Is it physical? Is it emotional? Is it relational? Is it spiritual pain? All the types that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. And I was so amazed and overwhelmed by the hurts that exist. And that is just such a small microcosm, Mm -hmm. but they have given me courage because so many of them are facing things I've never had to face. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow they're finding the strength to pick up this book. They're finding the strength to be in the word. They're learning to lean on God. And so when I am tempted to fall under the woe is me under that shadow of pain, I think of my readers and I think, wow, look what they are doing. Mm -hmm. Let's link arms together and draw on each other's hope and courage so that we can continue to put one foot in front of the other, Mm. one step at a time. Mm. Mm. So well said. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's been my joy and delight. Thank you. Toward the end of our conversation, I love how we have the opportunity to talk about some of the strategies and techniques that Dr. Michelle used in her life as she was going through pain and suffering to develop those positive, good mental pathways. 
And one of the ones that we didn't have an opportunity to talk about that has been really important in my life over the last couple of years, as you've heard me talk about Corey and my journey through some really difficult times, uh, which we share in episode 39 from June 6th, more about if you want to hear that in more detail. Um, But one of the things that has been important for us is to not overextend ourselves for me to not overextend myself. And that's one that Dr. Michelle talks about in her book. She says, whether your pain is physical, emotional, spiritual, grief, or another type, normal everyday tasks can require extraordinary strength, effort, or fortitude. Now is the time to simplify. That has been an extremely helpful strategy to me over the last couple of years and definitely is something that I share with my own clients when they're going through times of transition or change or pain or suffering. Definitely a very helpful strategy. Two other things that we didn't get the opportunity to talk about in our conversation. One is throughout the entire book, Dr. Michelle gives multiple examples of different biblical people and the ways that God met them in their pain and the different outcomes that they experienced. And I love that she goes through those of just showing that there is no one size fits all to pain and suffering that we all experience different types in different ways, and the result or the outcome is different for each and every one of us. So definitely a very meaningful part uh, of multiple parts of her book that I would highly encourage you to get the book to read uh, just for those examples. One other thing that I love that she does, she closes out every single chapter with music playlist recommendations, song recommendations that uh, just some that I've never heard of before, some that I have had on my playlist on repeat over and over and over again. Um, So that also is just a really valuable part of her book. So thank you again so much for listening in today to my conversation uh, with Dr. Michelle about her book, The Hem of His Garment. The link is in the show notes to get the book or to connect with her through her website or Instagram or Facebook. So I'm so grateful that you continue to join me for these bonus episodes as we journey with these women authors uh, as they bring new information, new books to life for us, new insights and wisdom to uh, to our lives. So thank you for supporting them and listening to these conversations. What an honor to help you to cultivate confidence, courage, and joy in your life and work. Thank you so much for inviting me to journey with you. I look forward to being back with you next week where we'll hear another story from a woman whom I love and am inspired by and look forward to learning from. Music